and welcome to a new episode of Melt. I'm Ritvika Gupta and on the show today we'll be taking a closer look at the Kanta World Panel Study which presents a report on consumer buying behaviour and growth opportunities for marketers in the FMCG industry. Anand Rangaswamy, editor of Melt, joins me today. Hi Anand. Hello. Anand, so you had a chat with uh, K. Ramakrishnan and Ian Dunkley from uh, Kanta World Panel and uh, there were some interesting uh, insights. So uh, which were the key findings which uh, interested you the most? I think there are lots of interesting nuggets, but the one that uh, blew my mind most was uh, the fact that uh, the dominance of Western India as a market, the dominance of it has reduced. Right. And that is got a whole lot of implications. The biggest implication, of course, is that uh, marketers would say, presume that if they uh, do a campaign in targeting consumers in Western India, they'd get X percent of their sales guaranteed. Right. Now, it looks like that X is not going to be X percent. It's still a large number in absolute terms, but as percentage of the whole pie, it's sort of shrinking. So marketers will have to learn A, to explore other markets mm -hmm. for their growth. This looks like you'll get no delta out of the West. You might get deltas elsewhere. Right. So all, all brands want to grow. Mm -hmm. So they've got to look elsewhere for the deltas is the point of this study. Right. The study also revealed that, you know, uh, consumers, for example, they are buying more natural products. Uh, local brands are growing and there's also immense growth in uh, men's products, like men's grooming uh, products and stuff like that. So uh, how do you think this will impact the decision making process for brands and marketers going ahead? No, I think the brands sort of saw it. This study is only a ratification mm -hmm. uh, from the, in fact, before the time of Patanjali, uh, we have seen uh, uh, natural products coming into the market perhaps not backed with as much confidence as has been done today, but we have seen it come. Uh, in fact, uh, during the conversation, uh, when uh, Ramki refers to Ayush as a new, new brand, I say, no, it's not new. Uh, you know, it's a two decade old brand, except they put a lot more energy into the brand today. So there was always a nascent market. Today, we've got consumers willing to pay a price for it, pay premiums for it. Mm -hmm. That's as far as the uh, natural products is concerned. As far as men's grooming, again, I would say it's not new. Marketers have seen the trend. Mm -hmm. You're going to see more jump onto the bandwagon. For example, you had Fair and Lovely all these years. Yeah. And then you got one clever marketer who said Fair and Handsome. handsome yeah. So you've had marketers targeting men in various categories mm -hmm. for a long, long time. I think you're going to see more energy and more impetus and more budgets uh, backing these trends. All right. So let's have a look at the conversation. Let's get ready to melt with K. Ramakrishnan and Yen Dunkley. Hello Ramki. Hello Ian. Hi. So Ramki, uh, give me the headlines of your FMCG study. Two parts to it. One is the longer term one and one is the 18 month one. Right. The longer term one, headlines being 75% of growth for FMCG over 15 years has come from rural. Second, we are seeing a shrinkage of uh, seasonality. Uh, the third factor is urban is actually shrunk from what it was. And fourth is the fact that West as a zone has become a little rusty. What it used to be a 34% contribution market has become 27 and a lot of parameters are not so great. Right. So these are highlights in the longer term. Right. Uh, before I come to you, Ian, uh, you know, when I read the study, the one that sort of shocked me the most yeah. was the West story. Right. Because uh, the implication is media plans getting right. redone if marketers follow your study. Right. And uh, right now, most of the media money is skewed towards West and North, right. really. So tell me, how do you read that uh, yeah, implications so of, of this? As you rightly said, media money is skewed towards West and North. Right. Uh, so even when they want to re reach West, there's a lot of Hindi-speaking channels, as they, as they call it, Hindi-speaking channel yeah, market. Yeah. So those, to that extent, will have their impact on the North as well. So therefore, specifically targeting West may see a, uh, see a, see a reduction in, uh, going forward if this is the trend that is to continue. That said, I think it's a question of choice. I mean, if, if West is shrinking, should they stop investing in West or should they reinvest more in this? Sure. Particularly given that there are more categories entering for the same amount of money, I think uh, people are getting sharper if they want to focus on the West. Right. Ian, uh, you're not from India, but uh, I still want you to feel this question. Uh, when he speaks about urban India sort of plateauing or he's saying even shrinking in the words that he used, what, what do you do? Is it that you scout for new mar markets? Or do, we, do you reinvest in this market to sort of squeeze some more juice out of it? What, what would you do as a marketer based on your study? Um, I think both are always going to continue. So right. you have to play them off against each other. Um, and there are going to be spells where one is going faster than the other. I mean, 
ultimately urban is always going to be the big power engine over time if what we see in other markets happens, but you've got to play both. Right. So how, how would you react to that same question, uh, Ramki? Yeah, so while 75% of the growth in the last 15 years has come from, from rural, uh, urban has shrunk, etc. But but nevertheless, there will be no, a comeback. When you say shrunk, not in absolute terms. Not in absolute As a terms. share of the pie. Uh, the urban uh, share is shrunk. No, 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 I'm not talking about the share. I'm talking about how much an urban household spends per month on FMCG, right. there has been a shrinkage. Right. I mean, if you, do, if you do away with inflation, if you look at volumes, there has been a shrinkage. Right. So that's what I mean by shrinking. That said, urban is also consuming more categories. So right. to that extent, I think it's not a question of urban remaining there. It will definitely go up the way it is. Right. Know? And of course, opportunities in rural will be continue to be big. Okay, now look at the other, shall we say, highlights of, of yours. Hmm. One of the funny data points I found was pack sizes. Yeah. As in, uh, in, in uh, getting introduced to a brand through a large pack size. Now, t t tell me, isn't that counterintuitive as a, as a result of uh, research? Yeah, so uh, we have been a small pack country for, for decades, Correct. I think. In fact, uh, innovation came in small packs. Absolutely, right? you're absolutely right. The shampoo story, the sachet story, it all came from small packs. And trial has been growing a lot by, by small packs. It continues to grow by small packs. That said, all we're saying is, if you look at growth rates of people entering a brand through small packs, versus growth rate of entering the people the brand through large packs. The large packs have grown a little more in the last few years. And that's on been a result of a few things. Uh, one is that uh, the larger packs have been priced aggressively right. by, by marketers in their own right. interest. If you bring it down per ml or per gram. Correct, right. correct. So they've been priced really aggressively. Second thing is they've been promoted heavily. Like for example, uh, uh, to give you a specific example of Dabur, glucose. Glucose was bought in small packs. One kg pack, if you buy, you get a paste free and it was a longer term promotion and that resulted in a substantial growth for that brand. Third is some recent innovations around the large packs as well. Give a, another example in point will be a Kisan. The bottle was the large pack always. Now there is a sachet with a spout in it which allows you to, to pour it out, right? So that convenience has given some growth. So innovation, pricing and promotions, marketed actions led, uh, have led to growth in recruitment even through larger packs. Right. Uh, Ian, uh you know, coming from a Kanta world panel uh, view rather than a Kanta India view, uh, are you seeing some similarities between what is happening in India and what is happening in other markets around the world? Or are you a little surprised by, by the India results? Um, I'm not so, so much surprised. I think pack size is a, is a tool for the manufacturers in terms of what exactly consumers are wanting. I think this is an example of, um, of people wanting better value, um, per quantity um, in India. But no, I think pack sizes move up and down depending on particular need um, from consumers. Uh, Ramke also touched upon innovations, uh, innov marketing innovations and packaging innovations both uh, playing a role. Is that consistent with what you see in other markets uh, across the world? Yeah, that's very much consistent. They're important tools that the, the marketeers, the manufacturers are all, all utilizing. Right. So uh, now we come to uh, say, Something uh, like e-commerce, where you do uh, add a rider, saying, albeit with a small base. Yeah. What do you see as the e-commerce opportunity for FMCG? See, we think we definitely think it is big. I right. mean, so in fact, there are theories which got floated around, which said that uh, India, in many in many things, in the evolution, skipped a few steps and went. Like for example, we didn't touch landlines; we went straight to mobile phones. So there was a point of time when uh, when we people said, will we move from general trade to modern trade to e-commerce, or will we straight jump into e-commerce? Is a debate that people are talking about. But that said, modern trade is also seeing a revival. But e-commerce, e albeit a small base, I think uh, in terms of penetration, it is getting significant. And from what we see from our data, we say that in all the categories that are bought online, the third largest is uh, FMCG. Right. Uh, phones followed by is fashion. Is that also counterintuitive in say the that sense? Uh, the fact that e uh, FMCG is so large on e-commerce, yeah. isn't that counterintuitive in the sense uh, you would think when you went to modern trade or to e-commerce, you wanted volumes. For example, in the US or Europe, you buy dozens of bottles of Coke or Pepsi. Right. We are not in that kind of consumption country at all. Absolutely. So what is it that we're buying on e-commerce from your study? So I think it's uh, from, we've spoken to housewives about it. What is driving them to come towards you? They are talking about two things. One is deals. Pardon? Deals. Right. And second thing is convenience. Right. Uh, now deals, I think, progressively have come down given the new e-commerce regulations and stuff like that. But convenience seems to continue for them. It's a, because it's a very quick thing that they do and it happens to land up at home and they don't have to do anything more. So to that extent, in categories where they can, they are shifting to that. Like, for example, let's say baby products. Mm. Diapers 
huge percentage has gone to uh, gone towards e-commerce. So that is one. Right. And if you look at non-baby regular household products, the, the large volume uh, periodic products, they are moving towards e-commerce and the impulsive short-term top-ups are not going to e-commerce. Kirana or whatever yeah, it is. That's correct. Yeah. So uh, another lovely little nugget from your study was uh, you know the lack of focus on men and the opportunity yeah. with men. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, tell me a little more about that. Uh, wh why do you think uh, marketers haven't focused on targeting men as in many categories? Why do you think that's happened? Uh, that's a difficult question for me to answer because it, marketers have to answer that. But we definitely believe that the men are as variety seeking as women when it comes to grooming now. Right. There are some data points to prove that. Which is to say that if the household chooses, uh, let's say, six brands in a year of soaps, which is, a, which is a data point, the men's panel, which is men alone, are also choosing five brands. So which means they are also seeking variety, Right. number one. Number two, uh, they, are, they are doing a lot of online purchases. Third the distinct number of lack of options available for men is making them try things which are meant for women as well. Right. So all of these put together lead us to believe that there is a market and that market is going to be big. And I think it's a matter of time before somebody really focuses on that and pushes it hard. But more than they are already doing. Yes. Uh, what about there was a bit, uh, Ian, uh, about variants, the importance of variants in your study, how variants can grow the market, but not necessarily large numbers of variants. You've got to do the right variant is what I'm getting. So. How does the marketer play the variant game? A, how do you decide whether you need a variant or not? B, if you need a variant, what is the variant and what will the variant do for the mother brand? Yeah, that was interesting in the study. So, so what, what I took away is that one or two variants is um, under a brand works well. But if you're going to have more than that, you need to have a really underlying reason as to why. Otherwise, that third and fourth variant won't really drive much volume. Yeah, it won't justify the... When the investment, investment in, yeah. in having the additional one. Just to add to uh, what Ian was saying, uh, some of the largest brands, even if you take the largest brands in India, the top two variants contribute 95% plus of their total volumes. So the, the remaining six, seven, eight, whatever number it's contributes just, uh, to the balance. Long tail eating yeah. up shelf space. Exactly, shelf space, money, all mm -hmm. of those things. But there are some brands which have succeeded, examples being Dove and uh, Tresemme, we have played the, uh, the, the game of uh, varianting well. Mm. But in, clearly they have been in problem solution mode, which means if there is a problem and if, the, if that variant is meant for that solution, like let's say dry hair or uh, what uh, black ends, specific problems, specific solution, those are the cases. So like Ian was saying, if there's a strong enough reason for a variant to exist, then it's worth it. Otherwise, two variants are more than sufficient is what uh, we have seen. Uh, and if you just add a third for no reason at all, you do not have a delta, basically. That's true. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, so now I saw in your study, I think uh, one that uh, all marketers will look at is what Patanjali seems to have done for an entire category of of nature care or whatever you may call it. Right. You know, they started it. They, they were clearly the impulse, uh, the sort of driver of this business, but they seem to have lost ground somewhere. Right. So what do you think has happened to the category itself of all natural products? Right. Okay, so uh, I, I would actually uh, be loath to write it off, uh, Patanjali, because right. they still have over 40% households in India buy at least one Patanjali product in a year. Right. So which means their reach is still really big. Right. They haven't grown and maybe they've even shrunk a little, that is, that is a fact. But what they have done is they have spawned off an entire category of natural products across people. Right. And those are happening in two ways. One is a brand born for natural, right. like Ayush right. or like Dabur always was. Mm. So like Ayush is a new brand entirely meant for natural. Not a new brand actually, it's 20 odd years old. Ayush, uh, the lever Ayush, the relaunch that, that the happened. Relaunch, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, entirely, sure. entirely for naturals. Mm. And the second one is uh, a, br a brand or a variant that was not really natural, but they introduce a, uh, a, a, a variant which has an ingredient which is natural. Like for example, pepsodent clove, right. if they say, or let's say live boy honey. So these are uh, ingredients that are coming in. What we notice is that if you leave Patanjali out and if you look at the natural variant stroke brands that have got launched, their growth is significant. So therefore, the natural as a wave is continuing, and they are not growing. Not only are they are growing, not only at the cost of Patanjali, but also at the cost of uh, non-naturals. Right. Which means the natural as a wave is something that is definitely going uh, uh, going forward in this country. Right. So, uh, what are the other categories which could benefit other than the ones we've already seen? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, are, are you seeing any trends? That suggests something else. So what we're saying is there's a lot of natural happening in personal care. Mm. Now, almost everyone says they have aloe vera, I have uh, amla, all of these things are happening. There is quite a bit of natural that's happening in the food. 
I think the next wave will be home care to see a lot more natural. Right. Saying, uh, we, we've used turmeric for cleaning in the past, can we do that? You know, those kind of things. So right. I'm sure that's the next wave. Right. You know, uh, the last few days we've been consumed by what is happening on the stock market. Yeah. And everybody's looking to answers to FMCG, really speaking. Right. You know, everything else aside, right. FMCG will point to perhaps uh, you know, a solid economy, a weak sure. economy or whatever. What is your... Uh, I mean, for me, the biggest concern I have is what you're telling me about urban India, right. where, you know, you should say urban India dipping is a bit of a worry. Right. So what, what are the larger trends you're seeing in this study? So actually in FMCG, uh, see, like you, uh, like you know already, we, we track what is bought by right. our household. Absolutely. So that is the first reaction. So we saw a dipping uh, coming in Q2 of 2018 itself. So by the time the trade picks up and by the time it starts reflecting on companies, it was the next two quarters. So you started hearing noises about a slowdown towards the end of 2018. Likewise, we are actually seeing a revise, uh, revival right now. You know, right. If you see the data for April, May, 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 June, we are seeing that the FMCG market is bouncing a little back. So which means what was negative is becoming positive. So I think again, it's a matter of time by the time it, that gets revived. So we, we believe it's a revival in on the cards. Right. So w tell me, going back to your, the core study, what are the other points that we've not covered which uh, excite you about your study and therefore should excite a marketer, where a marketer can learn. Yeah, so uh, one of the things which is starkly coming out in this is that uh, baby foods. Right. Like in baby foods. Not only baby foods, other categories. Yeah, uh, in specifically. Baby in foods going towards natural again. No, baby foods shrinking. Right. So baby foods as a consumption. See, like for example, I think uh, a whole lot of mothers have got a lot, gotten a lot cautious in the last few years, starting with several crises that happened. Uh, but particularly in baby foods, we are seeing a, a kind of a drop in volumes. Uh, and when we speak to mothers, we hear things like the fact that they want to add some superfoods into that, like for example, ragi at an earlier stage, or maybe uh, some other grains and um, um, dry, dry fruits in the, in the age group of uh, 12 to 24 and so on and so forth. So to that extent, uh, the need for a homemade or a, a more natural based stuff exists and that option is currently not available. So that's a stark thing that comes out of uh, this. Uh, then we also see that there is premiumization happening. Uh, even though we are seeing that there is market difficult conditions and things like that, the premium brands are still growing. So which means the aspiration to buy premium is there and that is coming at the cost of something. What is that something seems to be staples. Right. Now the quick question is why will somebody reduce staples? Why will they reduce salt and atta kind of thing? Mm. The point is in all of these, there is a lot of stocking and there is a lot of wastage. Mm. So when people want to ration it, they are able to do it. They are able to find those spots in that. So right. that is what they are using to fund the premium purchases. Right. That have. right. So we, also you saw a shift coming from uh, loose and unpackaged to packaged. Yeah. You know, that's an interesting trend that you are seeing across, yeah. Yeah. which I saw, I mean, some of the obvious categories, right. uh, oil and so on. But then if I went deeper, I saw even stuff like hair oil was, yeah. was mentioned there. Yeah. So tell me, what is the trend and what can, what can I get out of it? Yeah, so. Uh, and this is not urban India. Yeah, this, this is, is across. Across. Right. So there is there is loose, there is unbranded, and there is branded. Now we have seen that. Is also premiumization to an extent? Yes, it is. Right. It is. So we see that definitely there's a move from unbranded to branded. But we don't see households giving up unbranded to move to uh, branded. Ah, you said it's a complex habit change. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it, there is duality for a long time, which means they probably reserve some occasions for branded and reserve some occasions of purchase for unbranded. So if so far, find it difficult to find households which completely junk unbranded and move to branded. So they, that, I think it's a kind of a coexistence of both together and then slowly they start becoming more and more branded. So branded is increasing, but dual households are increasing more. So it's almost, you have to find the occasions to sell it to them. Correct. It's Correct. like what chocolates did maybe in the 1980s. Absolutely, yeah. yeah Something so, like that to do, yes. So it's a, it's a habit change. Absolutely. So Ramki, tell me, if I were a media planner and I got hold of this study, hmm. uh, what do I learn from this? Okay, there's quite a bit to learn uh, in the sense that uh, most of our penetration, penetration studies mentions that there is a large percentage of consumers who buy a brand only once a year. Right. Right. And that once a year varies from which part of the year it is. Right. So the traditional media planning of saying, I'll be in bursts at different occasion, whom do you catch in that? Right. So if you have a large percentage of people who are buying once or even twice a year, then to catch them around the year, it's not going to be possible to do bursts at all. Right. It does call for continuous presence. So that will be a big learning uh, for yeah. them in the first place. Which your study said, spoke about seasonality also. That is true. So yeah. even for a cola, you say, 
uh, there is no seasonality. Yes. Rather, the, the importance of seasonality is less than you thought it was. Yeah. So, I'll just qualify that a bit. We, yes. we measure only what comes into a household. Right. Right. So, from a what comes into a household perspective, we see that summer products seasonality is coming down uh, quite a bit. In the sense, the index of seasonal months versus non-seasonal months is coming down uh, quite a bit. Is there any way to attribute that to anything? I think… Uh, it's just urbanization and refrigerators and… Longer summers. Huh? We've longer had longer summer? summers, definitely. Right. Yeah, so uh, global warming, if you right. if you call it that. Right. So certainly that's been one of the factors. But winter products are holding on to be continue to be seasonal. So winter products are making it shorter and shorter periods, like in body lotions and skin. Mm, okay, a yeah, longer summer, you'll have a shorter yeah, winter. That's correct. So tell me, Ian, I'm going to sort of close with you. Tell me why this world panel is important. That's one. The second bit is trickier. Considering the numbers, number of respondents on the world panel, is it large enough for me to take it? As gospel, well, I think I think this, this, the size is why it's quite an interesting study, a longitudinal study of looking at the changes in people's behaviour over time, gives an unparalleled insight into what people are changing, why they're changing it, and to understand. And as we've talked about FMCG overall growth, it's it's sort of fairly flat. Um, so understanding where the pockets of growth sit within all those different changing aspects is really helpful. Um, and then as to the size, well, statistically, we read accuracy um, that's enough to make the conclusions that we do. So no, I, I don't think, I'm not uh, sort of targeting you or any researcher uh, statistically. All I'm saying is perhaps India is far more complex than, you know, statistical probability allows you to say this is actually enough, but is it enough is the question I'm asking. Ramki, you want to feel so that? I, I can pitch in here in the sense mm. that... Uh, uh, the largest panel size in the world is in India. Right. We have 85,000 households. Right. Now, uh, 85,000 is, is way beyond statistics. I mean, statistically, mm. if we have 30,000, 32,000 households, uh, we can represent India well enough. Right. But we want to get far more granular and want to represent a smaller brand, smaller variant, smaller, uh, uh, you know, categories. Smaller market. A, smaller markets, and which right. is the reason why we have gone up to 82,000. Right. Now, uh, is 82,000 enough? Uh, to a large extent, we believe it is. Right. Uh, can it be bigger? Of course, it can be bigger. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I hope uh, marketers who watch this uh, get some insights from what you guys have shared with us. And uh, I hope you're wrong about uh, the flatness of urban India, as I, I'm sure a lot of marketers will hope you're wrong about that. Sure. You know. And uh, no, I think it's just because it's such a bellwether for the state of the health of the economy that one helps. There's still some pockets of growth in in urban India. Right. Thank you, Ramki. Thank you, Ian. Thank, Thank you, you so Ramki. much. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that was the conversation. Anand, um, what do you think are the key findings that marketers need to watch out for? I think this entire interview and more important than the interview, the study itself is something they should have a look at because we've only touched uh, a small portion of the study considering the limited time we had for it. Yeah. But uh, I, I would look at uh, uh, urban India flattening and the opportunities going from urban to mm. semi-urban and rural as a big one. I would certainly look at uh, the implications of the change in uh, demand. For example, if Western India is becoming flat and you're going to get growth only in uh, new markets, mm. not north and west, for me that means media monies will also start shifting to Bengali and Tamil and Kannada and Telugu and Malayalam and Odia and so on. Mm. And that means uh, marketers will have to relook their media plans and media agencies will have to relook at the way they view India. Mm -hmm. But this is one data point, the Cantal World Panel study. Marketers will look for more data points to confirm this sort of bias. And once those data points come in, you'll see change. All right, so that's a wrap on this episode of Melt. Uh, you can watch all our content on our social media platforms. Our handle is ready to melt. And I'll see you next week, same time, same place. Goodbye.